and you're live. Good evening. Uh, how peaceable shall we start tonight? I have been uh, uh, just tying up some loose ends on tonight, and it just kept going off into another direction and another direction. Uh, then all of a sudden, when I was uh, checking myself and, you know, looking at my face and looking in the mirror, and suddenly I realized my glasses are covered with speckles of paint. Because today and yesterday, I was painting a ceiling <laughs> right here at the campground. They are kind enough and needing some help as they are um, uh, building and upgrading some things to bottle water. And so uh, they have a um, like an 800 foot underground aquifer here on the campground built by nature. And so they have uh, felt that of the Lord to develop and uh, a bottling thing. And their uh, their first attempt went really well. Then when they tried to expand, um, it kind of it went the wrong way. And then people didn't pay their bills and everything kind of fell apart. So now they're coming back again and, and getting fired up. It's called hydrate. Anyway, so... Uh, um, just getting the last few speckles off of here. I'm supposed to have my, I had put some angels on that pair of glasses I lost on the roller coaster. They're probably still staring at them somewhere. Nobody ever found them. So maybe during the off season, when they go over every inch of that roller coaster, they'll find my glasses. And uh, I'm going to send them an email to the lost and found of um, Dollywood and remind them don't don't give up on me I haven't given up but uh, on the other hand sometimes a pair of glasses isn't good for you so maybe maybe it was best that I lost them anyway since these glasses are some of the best best prescription I've ever had well as usual when I am wanting to talk about a subject and I'm really disturbed by uh, people's uh, take on worship and how uh, some people feel like if you're not groveling on the ground, you're not worshiping. Or if, you're, if you've got a drum in the background with a slight beat, you're not worshiping. Um, you know, you, if you're not following all these rules, you're not worshiping. And I noticed uh, in the study, I've got... Uh, Um, that uh, a few things here was um, in the Old Testament, worship was a physical act involving the body, involving surroundings, music, notes, people, places. But worship in the New Testament seems to be more a moment. Joy and I were going through the definitions that we had about the difference between praise and worship. And um, so these are some of the things, you know, praise is different than worship. Praise is more the high lifting up of God uh, and that worship is more exalting. That praise can be a lot of people joining together, um, and and there is corporate praise and there is corporate worship, but it seems like to us that praise is more an outward expression, and worship is more one on one. Even in a corporate worship, even in a church full of people, when you are worshiping, it does seem. Like it's more one-on-one. -on -one. So in the title, I said, how to worship your way out. I have to get to that first, the same way last week, or was it the week before when I said I was, you know, wanting to teach on something, but I hadn't really taught 
what it was so that I could talk about what it isn't. And uh, so then we said, uh, praise is lifting up with others. Praise is, in, is usually in most of the time, including music. And praise also includes works, such as some people do dances, some people do flags, some people do, um, you know, just emotions and more movement and more physical activity, whereas worship is more solemn, um, not quite as active. Now, that is true also because uh, in the Old Testament, the word worship uh, is described as making one prostrate on the floor, flat on your face, flat on your belly, and to make yourself low in order to lift or show a higher level to another. So even in the Old Testament, when it talked about they worshipped the wrong God, they were making themselves low. They were making themselves to show that God to be higher. They were placing themselves under the God to lift the God up, even if it was made of stone or wood. And it was more a physical thing. An act in the Old Testament worship was more a physical act of laying oneself out on the ground, making yourself low in order to lift something else up. Uh, now, uh, praise is exalting, and so and worship also is exalting. But praise is more with others, and, and but worship is more alone. A one-on-one -on -one thing and it's also praise is about what he's done what he's doing uh, what he will do uh, it is a, a joyous excitement of the actions of God whereas worship is more about him just him alone and what he is doing and um, let me turn this here. It's facing the wrong way. Uh, there. Um, so then worship is exalting. Also, what you are doing in worship, you are glorifying. And what you do in praise is what's done. So, or, or what's going to be done in action. It also has the praise involves your body more. Worship doesn't. Worship is less movement. You know, there's nobody dancing all around, doing crazy stuff during worship. Uh, it is a more about him, what he wants to receive, what he wants to receive as glorifying him. Because when you're praising him, you're speaking of the things he's done you're saying who he is, what he does. When you're worshiping him, you're saying who he is, um, and what what he has, you know, what he has uh, for us. Um, now, uh, when you come to the word, the word worship, there's an interesting aspect that um, is. Um, part of the word worship. For some reason, out of out of nowhere, it became my desire to to study the word worship. And I'm, it was like I had to look up the history of worship, and almost as though, in a way, my spirit, my heart, the the spirit of God was telling me how he invented the word worship. Because you got to remember that there was no English word worship. So how do you, how do you as God bring about a word that you can then develop in a language, in the English language, that once you have established this word, for something in the language, then you can turn it and say, that's what I want you to do towards me. So God was kind of showing me how 
he developed this word worship. And it came from an English term, or in the English, it came from the term, believe it or not, a worth, W-O-R-T-H, space, ship. And of course, it would be English, it would be England, because they were the Navy. They were the ship people. Uh, every country was connected to another country except for England. So when it came to the coastlines, most countries, their coastlines, they had minimal ships, they had, you know, fishing trawlers, they had some wars, some battles, but it wasn't really a thing. But when England was developed, it was all about ships. And so the word worthship actually comes from an old English term of the worth ship because some ships were not containing great treasure like you know if when someone says a spanish ship you don't really think of much you know the square sail something like that but if someone says a spanish galleon you think of gold you think of the atocha you think of a spanish galleon full of silver and gold that sunk off the coast in a hurricane everybody's looking for it and the value that's in that ship and this is where this comes from is that the worth ship was a vessel that contained the valuables. It had contained the aristocrat. It contained the power, the authority. And when this ship was um, called, it was a word that came into their mind that this ship was worth something. And so as this word developed, God turned it towards him. I am the worth ship. I am the one who contains the value. I am the one who contains all that you'll ever need, all of your supply, all of these things come are aboard me, are contained within me, and I am arriving in the port. I am coming to your country. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is where that word came from. And that's how God developed that word. So um, where we're going to go first is... Um, in Acts 4.2, uh, I will extol and magnify the Lord and celebrate for what has happened. What that's talking about there is um, uh, did I cover everything? Yes, I did. All right. So Acts 4.2 You know me and my uh, my wonderful things. All right. And we're speaking to the people and the priests and the temple commander and the Sadducees stood there being distressed because they taught the people and announced that Jesus was risen from the dead. So this is uh, Paul and Silas. They laid hands on them and put them into custody until tomorrow, which was for the evening. Most of them hearing N word believed, and a number of men came in. And now this is a different type of worship. This is a different type. This is where they're extolling and magnifying and showing God to be great. And it says that they taught and magnified the Lord and celebrated him. Um and in verse 21, okay, okay, so in verse 21, math, uh, Acts 4, 21, um, 4, 2 is where they were put in prison, 4, 21 is where they come out. But again, having threatened them, they let them go, finding out nothing that they could punish them for. And on the account of the people, because all glorified God on the things that were happening. For the man to whom this miracle of healing had been occurred was more than 40 years of age. So this is the first type of, of worshiping your way out. This is when uh, it is more not just you, but 
people around you. Everyone is involved with the same situation. So this is where uh, well, exactly all they were speaking. <coughs> They were arrested. And when they were arrested, they were put in jail. And then when they were put in jail, they had to spend the night. This is not the one where they cried out at midnight and sang and, and praised God. This is the one where they were they were just in jail for the night. And they came out the next day. And this is when the Sadducees pulled them forward. And it says they were about to punish them, but they couldn't because of the people. On the account of the people, because they all glorified. God on this thing that was happening. So when we are all worshiping, when we are all glorifying God, the plans of evil fall to the ground and cannot be done. The plans and intentions of evil cannot happen. And uh, let's see if there was one other thing here. Because they threatened them, they told them not to speak anymore uh, in this name. And of course, this is where Peter and John said, well, I'm sorry, you know, whether you're speaking of the laws of men or the laws of God, we cannot tell. But we are not able to speak. Uh, we are not able to not speak what we have heard or seen. And they all glorified God. So when miracles happen, when People that don't know God see miracles when people that see people do exploits and healings. You will get people together to glorify God and it will stop the enemy. And it is your way of worshiping your way out of a situation, in this case, out of jail. They wanted to beat them. The Pharisees said, we're going to beat them and let them go. And uh, they got talked out of it. They said, whoa, wait, you know, you can't do that. <coughs> and that was the plan uh, that was foiled. But what that, what, uh, which brings us to John 4, 23, which is where I had my Bible well set up. Okay, so starting in, in, uh, Verse 22, John 4, 22. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is of the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father also seeks such a ones that worship him. God is a spirit, and the ones worshiping him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So this is a little bit more training on what God's talking about on how to worship. Okay, so the first thing we want to know is, he said, the true worshipers. Oh, well, this is where the, I started getting late and starting to run behind because I thought, you know what? I really haven't studied out what the word true meant. What makes you a true worshiper? We've got worshipers, but what's a true worshiper? Well, it turns out that a true worshipers are alive. They are excited. Uh, if you look up, you can look up in your theers, uh, words of, of New Testament Greek, number 228 in the theers which means someone who truly recognizes and is recognized. This is, maybe that's a better way to put it. A true worshiper is one who is recognized as a true worshiper by the ingredients of their life, by the nature of that name, According to their actions, they have a... Oh, they drink for me. Thank you, sweetie. Mm. 
I have been working in some cold weather lately. It says, um, now, and this, this gets fun right here, because it says you recognize and you see the true ingredients, the nature of the name according to actions, a real nature. Now, I can tell here in the Thayers that the um, scholars that wrote the Thayers are, are making more sentences here. It's like, usually it's, here's the word, here's the definition in this, in this verse. Here's the word, here's the verse, here's the definition. But not here. Um, you know, what was exciting was that when you get to this word in the, in the Thayers, there's usually about that much describing a word. Sometimes you'll get a good-sized thing or a column. But when it came to this word, worship him in spirit and in truth, there was three and a half. Let's see. There was two columns, two and a half columns of words that were talking about how the apostles were trying to describe a true worshiper. And, and honestly, it looks like they ran out of definitions because it says in the fairs that the word that John was using, according to actions and real nature, has in its content opposing. And OPP is in the definition. And what opposing and OPP means in the definition is that it's easier to describe the opposite than it is to describe the actual. Isn't that something? Imagine it, you, you try to describe the most loving person you knew in your life. Who was the one who influenced you the most? You could talk on and on and on and we still not totally describe your love for them, their love for you, the years, the time uh, that you spent. You, you have a hard time coming to the end of your description. So what they're doing here in, in, this, in this description here is they're saying, we have to say the opposing or opposite in order to fully contain what it is because we cannot describe to you well enough what true worshiper is but we can tell you what a true worshiper isn't isn't that something that literally in the in the greek it's saying a true worshiper is uh, recognized by his ingredients by the nature of the name which he is using according to the actions of his life and according to his real nature. That someone can see the ingredients of his life and know that he is a true worshiper. That everything about him magnifies his worship. Um, it would be a golfer or a true golfer. A true golfer is the pro on TV. Many people are golfers, but the true golfer is a pro on TV. That's a good example. But here it says it is easier for to describe what he is not. And that is no pretending, not frail, not defective, not uncertain, not similar to anything else, and not imagined. Not imagined. So someone who is worshiping and, and it's like they're imagining. They're, 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 they're not there. And I thought that's interesting that you actually go into the negative and the opposite to describe true. It's, it's, it, it is hard to describe true compared to false. False is great. You can quickly put a fence around the word false. 
but it is harder to put a fence around truth. And so he literally couldn't put into all the words necessary. And in the condensed version of the Bible, there's just not enough room to, to fully explain what a true is. Uh, so in, but, um, and there are two types of true in that same verse, because in 228, it's talking about the ingredients of a true worshiper. But in 225, it is talking about truth according to fact. And so that is tangible, touchable, knowable man's knowledge. Isn't that something? Isn't that something that there's two words that say true in King James Version in the Bible, and you don't know that one true is talking about the true that is, you know, not false. It's unimaginable. It's it's the ingredients. It's everything. It's it's a person's life. It's a person's ingredients. And the other true is just jot, tack, just fact. That's the other true fact. Uh, according to facts. with And then, uh, so now, um, <clears throat> for it says, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So now we understand truth. And they and now we understand worship is what's valuable, what contains everything we need, what arrives into our life, pulls into the port of our life, comes into our life. We worship, worship that. We are uh, worship the one that contains all value. And then we have the understanding of uh, in truth. We, we worship him in the truth, which is hard to describe. Uh, but then also the truth that is, here's the fact. You know, he's gone. This is the fact. He is gone. Then that word spirit. So we worship him in spirit. So here's another description of how we can be a worshiper because it says those who truly worship him, worship him in truth and in spirit and spirit. Uh, it's interesting because when I, it's a uh, number 4151 in the fairs and you know how I say like I got one columns or two columns or just earlier was three and a half columns. Well, this word spirit has three and a half pages of description. And so it took some searching to find out the John 4, 23, uh, which was where it says, you will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father also seeks those who will worship him. God is a spirit. The ones who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God's a spirit. You must worship him in spirit. At one point, I even thought that meant, you know, in the spirit meant just in your mind. But it's really speaking as far as God is a spirit. You must worship him as the spirit he is. And you must worship him as the fact that he is. You must worship him in the truth that he is. And you must worship him in the spirit that he is with your spirit. So kind of like. Like I've said before, you know, there's a part of us that will live longer than the body we live in. Um, so when the body is gone, what we are right now, our personality, who we are, continues to live. That is our spirit. That is the part of us that we worship him in spirit with. So we worship with our spirit, our eternal uh, being that dwells in this body. To, we worship his eternal mirroring his his eternal being his spirit which is of course in everything it is a it is, and so we worship him in a spirit a the same it is a life giving spirit he is talking about this and in this verse he's talking about the same spirit that he is talking about here that we worship him in is the same spirit that raised christ from the dead um, which is verse 24. And then the fullness of Christ, which is John 3, 34. So uh, let me go to John 3, 34 real quick. There is 3, and there is 34. The one receiving his testimony has sealed, has sealed that God is true. For the one whom God 
sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give up give the Spirit by measure, and that is what He is doing. Is He is giving us the Spirit, and that is the Spirit that we worship Him with. So now that we've gotten an understanding here, uh, or a better understanding, I'm not saying we're we're experts here or anybody's. You know, we all will hear more teaching on worship, more teaching on, on the understanding of worship, but I know I've never heard anybody teach on the um, the original source of the word worship. I thought that was really cool when I came across that. I hope you like that. And so we can, um, when we're standing in worship, we can imagine, we can understand better the ship imagine that song about when your ship comes in you know uh, when my ship comes in well that's your worth ship you know and and you see but it's arrived in your life as you become a christian you become uh capable of, of offloading the, the valuables of that ship because everything is on that ship that you need and uh, all right <clears throat> so we get to at this point drink another little bit Mm. And we're going to go to Acts 16, 29. And it kind of scares me to jump around the Bible sometimes because <laughs> I have all these bookmarks in all of my books and then I don't have that book in front of me that has the bookmark or, oh no, what have you done? All right, so let's read the story here of what we can do with our lives. You know, oh, you know what? Before we do that, I want to get into a personal note for Joy and I on of learning about this. I had a dog, a giant schnauzer, and giant schnauzers are supposed to live 12 to 14 years, you know, something like that. Well, my giant schnauzer only lived eight years. And she passed because of a, a cancer. And um, during that whole time, uh, there was a lot of things going on in my life that were really crazy. And I wasn't paying attention to the whole situation. And it was part of God's plan to totally eradicate myself from myself. Uh, if you've ever heard that old saying, uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, that might have been true in the 40s and 50s and back in the farmer days. You were a good cook. You you, were, you had to be a good cook for those farmers, those hardworking men that built this country. But actually, what I have found out is that the way to a man's heart is to stomp on that thing. Break it into pieces. Leave absolutely nothing left behind that's recognizable. Now, you might say, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible. Well, no, what you don't realize is his heart is already broken into several pieces. My heart was already broken into several pieces. And I had designed my life around not letting, but, but protecting these broken pieces, of not letting them get damaged further. I was controlling, I was, I was mean, I was protective of this broken heart. But at this time, I was getting, you know, I had been through uh, Bible college, had been uh, through many experiences with Christ and the Holy Spirit and church services after church services. And Bible college was three hours a night, five nights a week, two services on Sunday for three and a half years. And we did a lot of things like that, of just soaking and being so much involved with the word of God that it was breaking me out. And I'm telling you what, it takes a lot to break out of a mindset. And I think Joy was moved by the Holy Spirit one time when she bought us these things called a, a clipped on your collar. What was that called? Um, um, iPod, uh, iPod shuffle. shuffle. If you remember the iPod Shuffle, that was a life changer for us because we little tiny square about the size of a you know one by one square, clip it on my collar, and I had it in my ears playing the New Testament for a year, over and over again, and. All, and, and Proverbs and Psalms and New Testament and Proverbs and Psalms and New Testament. 
It was like it would go for seven hours before, before it would need recharging. No, before it would uh, start over. Oh, again. before yeah, that's right. I had seven okay. hours. Yeah. And uh, uh, because of the way my mind was set up and being selfish the way I was and very, very selfish uh, and fighting narcissism, beginning to fight narcissism, I had not even realized I had it. Uh, I was focused on myself a lot and everything I was going through protecting this heart. So let's get back to this broken heart. In order for, in order, when I say you've got to have it crushed, you've got to stomp on that, thing, break it to pieces. Well, it was already broken. I'm trying to hold it together and I cannot heal it. I can't help it. I can't fix it. So it literally had to be something where I had to let go. I had to stop trying to pick up the pieces and put it back together and I'll be okay and sit there and cry and go, I'll be okay. I'll put it back together. No, I had to be completely devastated with absolutely no help. And this is what the passing of this dog did. Uh, for six, for eight years, I had this 70 pound devotion, love, absolute, complete sacrificial love of this dog i had not really known that not that people didn't love me like that and enjoyed it but i couldn't receive it from people she got me to open my heart and receive this kind of love so at her passing it was truly the greatest breaking of my heart that i'd ever had it was so bad and so strong and so powerful and it was accompanied by the loss of other dogs that were uh, my fault that we lost them. It was just didn't take them to the vet. And it was the selfishness in my brain, poverty mentality, you know, things like that. The vet said, you know, well, you should have wrote me a check and I'd have waited to deposit it, you know, because I just I missed it by a week. You know, you're supposed to get shots by a certain age. And, and then uh, I didn't realize that I had had out in the yard from the other wild animals and I took something out in the yard to clean it and I left it in the yard and then I brought it in and put it under the puppies and it was on there and there was nothing they could do and so uh, that was devastating and the loss of this dog was devastating I was just totally broken I couldn't function I stopped loving I stopped talking I stopped being involved with anything. I was just moving like a robot through the work. Go to work, come home, you know, dive into the TV or something so I didn't have to think. And uh, after a month of this and uh, just things falling apart, I called some friends of ours and, and, t and told them the situation. And, um, uh, um, and even how angry I was at the dog for dying and all the things that I went through. And they, uh, this doctor friend of ours, he said, I recently saw a teaching and I'm going to share it with you. And it was taught at a funeral. And what the man said at the funeral was, you have to worship your way out of the situation. Now, that was the first time I'd heard that term. So imagine that when someone passes away and grief is on you, that's allowed. Grief is a part of the recovery of coming out of a great loss. Joy have not, and I have not suffered a great loss before like this. I had never suffered a great loss like this. You know, um, we did. I didn't know how to handle it, and um, so hard to put it into words i was just at a standstill emotionally completely you know i wasn't talking wasn't loving wasn't spending time i just was in this depression this dark spot and he said if it's god you'll know it because you take it to him and he said what i want you to do is i want you to go to god and i want you to say i worship you over living my dog I worship you over the years that I had with her, 
the value she was to me. I worship you over the gift of her that you even gave to me so that I could know what love was. I want you to, it says, I want you to worship him. And so I did. And immediately something lifted off of me. Now, it didn't take but a few minutes for it to start to weigh back down on me. And he, and this, this guy was teaching me, he said, the grief is normal. Grief is a part of life. He said, but at a certain point, the devil gets a hold of grief. Depression gets a hold of grief. Something else gets a hold of grief and begins to use it as a weapon against you and holds you there. But it's not God. And this is how you know it's not God. And this is what he said. When you begin to worship, worship over her. And if it lifts, it wasn't from God. If it stays, then it's something that God wants you to do. And so uh, it had been a month. So immediately the grief lifted. What a feeling. And I mean, I was smiling. I was giggling, I was laughing, <coughs> and and the doctor said, you know, he said, um, so this has been going on this long, and I said, yeah, he said, well, you know what you need to do, you need to get off the phone, and you need to go hug and love your wife, and Joy, of course, was like, I had no idea what she was going through, I had no idea her side of the story, or what she wanted to share about this, but at that moment, it broke off of us. And then, of course, she was hearing the same te teaching, and we integrated this immediately into our lives, and we have never been caught in depression ever since, because we have felt grief, we have been through things, but we have worshipped the Lord over every instant. We worshipped the Lord when we didn't have money. It was trying to depress us. It was trying to get a hold of us. It was trying to pull us down and get us to say things like, we never have anything, you know, which only promotes not having it even more. Uh, it insults God to say, we never have anything. Because he's like, what do you mean? You've got me. I'm everything. What do you mean you don't have anything? You know, so we, we got out of that by saying, we worship you over our bank account. We worship you over the work situation where I don't have it. We worship you over our family members. You know, we worship you over our dogs, our situation, even if it has nothing to do with their health, just whether they're, whatever there's, whatever's going on. You know, if there's two dogs that are quarreling, we would worship the Lord over that and not take the weight of it on. And it would get solved. And it was such an enlightening thing. So how you take that is that now you understand what the word worship is now you can see that you focus on the value of god you focus on the value of what happened. for instance you're grieving over a lost loved one a mother an aunt an uncle you're grieving over a divorce you're grieving over a child and it's just been hanging on month after month after month Colossians 1.20 says that God has reconciled through his cross all things to himself and to each other. So he promises reconciliation through him. How you activate that reconciliation is the worship. And as we began to worship over the things we used to complain about, problems began to get solved. And as you say, and, and praise God, and tell in this worship time the good of what has been on. You know, I worship you over my mother. She was always there for me. I worship you over my mother because she was this and this and this for me. And a great this and a great that. And I worship you, Lord, over my mother. The grief will lift. And you will begin to... Uh, as I do, I remember the good things, even of the bad people in my life that are dead now. Even though they've passed away, they did, made mistakes. I worship, when their memory comes to me or something tries to get a hold of me from them, I worship the Lord over my dad. I worship the Lord over my mother passing. You know, I went to my mother's funeral and didn't shed a tear. I, I don't think, I, I think I was 
still was in the military. I was somewhere. No, I wasn't in the military when my dad passed away. But, uh, you know, that funeral and that situation didn't bother me. You know, it wasn't until years later that I began to worship the Lord because my heart was still broken at the time. I didn't know joy. I had not been to and had not been renewed in my mind. I was still brokenhearted, bitter, and angry over my parents and the whole situation. And it wasn't until years later that I began to worship the Lord over my parents and their part in my life. And I began to recover. So that totally broken heart now began to mend and come back together. And you could always tell. I was angry about something. I was still having a heart, broken heart in that area. And I would have to worship the Lord over that area. I worship the Lord over my broken heart concerning this person. I worship the Lord. And forgiveness too, because I had a guy working for me who would break my heart. He would let me down. He would be up and doing exactly, you know, and go in the right direction. And the next thing I know, Something would kick in, and he would go back to the flesh. He would go back to this, and he would do the wrong thing. And I had to constantly have my wife telling me, worship the Lord over him. Worship the Lord over him. And you know what? I didn't want to. I'm not going to worship the Lord over him. I don't ever want to see him again. I don't ever want to talk to him again. But, you know, I would worship the Lord over him. And within four or five days, he'd be like, looking for work again, or <laughs> something would come up, or I didn't have work, I didn't have enough work to share, and a job would come in that I would need work to share, and he would, you know, and we would start working together again, and I couldn't have done that if I had not worshipped over him, and let all of that go, and so it is your path to freedom to worship your way out of that situation, I worship you uh, over my house payments, I worship you over my, the bank trying to do this. I worship you over the tax situation I'm involved with. I'm worshiping you over, um, you know, I, Lord, I worship you over my W-2. I worship you over my taxes, Lord. I just lay hands on my taxes. And I call them done, and I call them fair, and I call them set up the way God said, you know, to pay Caesar what is Caesar's, and, and God what is God's. I thank you, Lord, and I worship you. You know, and, and I've never really worried about uh, my taxes, because you can look at my tithe to know exactly how much I made. And so if, as I've paid my tithe exactly and more than I should, then I don't have a problem with paying my taxes because I've already given God what is God's. So what's here, whatever's here, whatever happens, then God has arranged that's what's for Caesar. Because God said, give Caesar what Caesar's do, give God what God's do. So if I've given God what God's do, and I don't mean do as the law, I mean do as in my heart, what I what I consider in my heart above the law and beyond the law is, is my tithe, what I'm going to give, then I know that God's going to work out what is Caesar's. So you can say that over your text, over your house, over your house payment, and I want you to see that worshiping is your path out of the emotion the weight, the depression, the desire to give up and to say the wrong thing. Oh, this will never be open. Oh, I have had enough of this person. I am never going to talk to them again. You know, all of these things that you can worship over that ex-spouse. You can worship you over that child. And you see, when you worship and you worship over that person, you know you're letting go of your influence and control of what God's trying to do. Do you realize that you may be holding back God's plan for your child by trying to hold them under your will and your way? Is there way? something else I can help with? And so what you want to do is when, when you're frustrated with your child, you say, I worship you over my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife. I worship you over them, Lord. I worship you over them, and I release them, Lord, because... Sometimes we get in the way with our depressions, our attitudes. Well, fine. Oh, go ahead. You don't realize how manipulative that is. You don't realize how that's controlling the situation. That you, then, and you're not letting God 
influenced them. And I know my wife worshipped over me a lot. And, and here's what her patients did. After she had given me information, she had been sowing into me information, understanding, not being critical, not giving up on me, not criticizing me. She just kept feeding me information until one day I said, oh, I just made a narcissistic statement. And once that light came on inside of me, I was able to begin to pull out of it. Not that I don't ever deal with it. Don't you know, you know, you've know got 30 or 50 years or whatever, how many years old you are, you've got a lot of years in it. It can still pop up here and there. But the escaping of it, which is rare, began in my life. And that began because my heart was broken. That began because I worshiped the Lord. That began because I quit carrying the hurt and the discouragement of my life. And I began to worship my way out of a broken heart. Worship my way out of having my broken heart over my employee. Broken heart over my wife. Broken heart over my dog. Broken heart over my finances. Broken heart over a longtime customer. A broken heart over so many things. A uh, broken heart over minister friends that that would totally turn on me, uh, or you know, just and, and you know, all of a sudden, all those things began to bounce off because by worshiping over them, I released them, and without them having a grip on me, they couldn't pull me down, they couldn't pull me away, they couldn't pull me out of step. Because it would just bounce off me. I worship you, Lord, over that. I worship you. Well, I tell you, we say it a lot. And so here is the point of when you are, I'm saying the value of God and what he is and who he is, is greater in worth than whatever's going on. I am saying, God, you're worth more than this situation with my child, my spouse, my this, my that. I'm saying, God, I hold you above and I and I exalt you above everything that's trying to get to me. And, you know, that just causes God to come in and take his place among all of your problems and all of your troubles because you are releasing them from your control, from your ability to do something about it. I couldn't do anything about it. And God did. So Acts 16 29. He lifts you up. God lifts you up when you speak. I worship you over whatever. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I was waiting for you to chime in because Joy has been a leader in her friends. She has been helping her YouTube friends and her friends time and time again with this advice. For years. For years. Uh, and, uh, it has um, had hundreds of testimonies yeah, because of when how you're, it works. When you're, when you're upset over something or hurt over something, your focus is going to that situation. And, you know, your focus just stays there and it, it, the enemy uses it to torment you then. But when you say, Lord, I worship you over this, the Lord actually <laughs> lifts you up. <laughs> above that situation so that you're not focusing on it and and it doesn't get you down he lifts you up above it like he pulls you out of the mire and the muck and the clay you know you're stuck in focused on whatever that thing is that is crushing you or upsetting you and he'll lift you up over to, over it, lift you up, lift you out of it. When you say, I work over and you name it. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. The, the muck and the mire and the stuck. When they try to raise a ship off the bottom of the ocean, they put these bags of air inside of it. And they inflate the bags and the bags make the ship buoyant. And 
when they first started doing this, they would put all these bags inside the ship, inflate all the bags, and the ship wouldn't move. They thought, why isn't this ship coming off the ground? So they began to inflate the bag at one end and deflate the bag at the other end of the ship. So that this one end would come up, the other end would come down, and they, and they reversed the bags back and forth, filled this one up, and deflated it, filled this one up, and deflated it, and it rocked the ship back and forth, and it broke the suction off the mud on the bottom of the ship. So even though, though you see, the water has got to get under the ship for it to float up. doesn't matter how hard bad that ship wants to float to the surface. It's not going to float to the surface as long as there's suction. And without getting, so they, they learned how to, to pump air and water under the ships to break it loose from the suction bottom of the ocean so that's what worship does is that there's not only your boy this is good i just saw this so god fills you and god is is changing your life but you're still on the bottom you're still feeling held down you don't understand it. well that's because as much as god that's in you where you've sunk to in your life where you've gotten down and in the mire, there's a section they're still holding you down. So don't be discouraged. You are full of life. You are full of God. And even if you say to yourself, I still feel like I'm stuck. I still feel like I'm stuck. It's okay. Because even a ship on the, on the floor of the sea, when it's full of air, is still going to be stuck until it's rocked back and forth. Situations will come along begin to break that hold that the world has had upon you, and then, boom, you'll pop up to the surface all of a sudden. Be careful. Um, so, seeing... Um, all right, so 1629. I'm going to start... Uh, this is when Paul and Silas were arrested and whipped. And having laid... Uh, verse 23, having laid many stripes on them, threw them into prison charging the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, that jailer took them to the inner prison and locked their feet in stocks. And now it says, and having prayed. That's verse 25. That is a progressive word, having. It is not a start and finish word. Having prayed. So this is already saying having prayed. Having prayed. So they've already prayed. In verse 20, having already prayed towards midnight, Paul and Silas praised God in hymns and psalms, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and the foundations of the jail were shaken, and the doors flew open, and their bonds were loosened. And having been awakened and seeing the doors open of the prison, the jailer drew out his sword as though he would kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And asking for lights, he rushed in, and, becoming, and, and coming in there trembling, he fell before Paul and Simon. So, Paul and Silas are doing exactly what we're talking about here. They are praising. They are praying. Because first, they prayed. You know, these stocks can't keep us. This prison can't hold us. Who knows what they were praying? But they were praying. And they were probably, in their prayer time, worshiping. Worshiping you, Lord. You know, I worship you over this jail. I worship you over these stocks. Worship you over this situation. Remember, they're in pitch black. Center of a jail back in AD whatever, AD whatever. They're in a jail. Talk about a jail. Wow. We're talking no lights, no TVs, no lounge, no bathroom. We're talking jail. He has to get a light to go in there and see them. And so, what are they doing? They are worshiping. Praising, singing hymns out of the jail. But you see, before they got the earthquake, 
before they got the prison doors open, they were already free because they had already prayed and worshipped and praised and got free. They were already free. It was almost like, oh, God's up there going, and I hear singing coming from a dungeon. What's going on down there? Hey, my kids are in there. And all his voice had to do was say, hey. <laughs> and boom, boom, boom. Now, I don't know the design of that jail. I don't know how jails worked back then. And I don't understand exactly, but that a great earthquake, um, the doors were opened and all of the bonds were loosened. Now, personally... I've seen a lot of earthquakes on YouTube. I've seen a lot of earthquake videos. I've seen doors get bound, and I've seen doors collapse, and I've seen doors get stuck shut. But I've never seen doors get loosened, you know. And I certainly haven't seen, you know, the, the stocks come off of anybody's feet. I would never have seen that. But that's kind of odd that the same earthquake that opened the door also takes the hand and the cuffs off your feet. That's not just a regular earthquake. That's that's something that is a shaking. So maybe these kind of stocks were the kind where you have two rings that come together and you pound a spike between the two rings and that let's hold it together. And the earthquake shook the spike out. So that the you know the stocks are only held by the spike. And that spike, when it pulls off, the stocks will fall. So the spike came out, and that spike was because of the worship and the prayers. And so even before the gates were opened, they were already free. So I want to encourage you with this, that not only does worship set you free and get you out of something, as it got them out of prison, it also gets you free before anything's happened around you. Before it's happened, you're already free. As you worship, as you praise, as you sing hymns, and hymns have the word worship in them, you know. So in those hymns that they were singing, it was probably worship. So while you're worshiping, you're being set free even before the doors open, even before the stocks fall off. Even before the situation changes, even before, you're already free. Because you're worshiping. You're worshiping God. And so that that worth ship came into that prison. And it granted everyone's freedom. And of course, it was so dark, Paul said, well, everybody's still here. Well, where are they going to run to? It was pitch black or dark. Nobody knew how to get out of there. Nobody knew what was going on. It took the light coming in to lead him out. And so your worship not only opens uh, the doors before they're open, it opens the doors. It not only opens the doors before they're open and opens the doors, it also brings someone with a light that's going to show you how to get out. And I have the honor and the privilege to be someone that can say, here's the light. I'm bringing you now this light into the dark place where you've been hiding and not knowing how to get out of. To say, worship. Worship the Lord or speak it with your mouth. I worship you over this. And I promise you, when you start doing that, even before the situation changes, you will start to feel free. And in your starting to feel free, as Paul and Silas did, it says, after praying, not before they prayed, not while they were being whipped. It says they were put in the stocks, left in the dark, 
after they prayed, then they started to sing. Then they sang the hymns. Then they were worshiping. And when they started worshiping, it made them free. And then after they were free in their heart and they were singing, it didn't matter if the doors were open. Then the doors were open. And then after the doors were open, nobody could do much because it was so dark. You didn't know which way to go. And somebody brings the light. So this situation is happening right now in your life. This is the light that you've been looking for. This is the light that comes in. Because it says that he fell down. The guy with the light. It says that he fell down. He rushed in trembling and fell before Paul and Silas. See, he'd be Old Testament. He thinks falling is worship. Leading them out. Someone is going to lead you out. Someone is going to tell you even more than what I'm telling you. Because this is your moment. When you're being led out. And sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're going to see people get saved from your testimony. And Paul and Silas said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You so also. You shall also be saved. You and your household. And, of course, he took them out uh, at that hour of the night. He washed their stripes. And uh, those things that belonged to him. And then Paul and Silas baptized him and his family. Can you imagine the freedom that Paul and Silas had to have bruises and stripes and whip marks all over them? And yet now they're standing in water and baptizing the family. It wasn't about them. See, it doesn't matter. You're going to come out and do what God's called you to do. You've been put in that prison by people that didn't understand you, people that controlled you, people that dominated you, threw you in this dungeon, did hurt you, did so many things to you. You're coming out now. You're coming out now because you're worshiping over them and their names. You're worshiping over that situation. And you are coming out. And you're going to fulfill what God had planned for you. And you know what? The jailer isn't the one that whipped him. You know, he's innocent. He's just doing his job. There are people in your life that have done things, but it was their job. They didn't know what they were doing. Just forgive them and love them, baptize them, tell them the gospel. It's like Paul did. Uh, and he even brought him to his house and set him at the table and ate. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and it says here, they exalted and extolled the Lord. The worship that started in the deepest, darkest prison is now happening in the chamber. The household of the prison keeper. So the people that have held you back, they may be the ones that help you the most. And the ones that did you wrong, they may be innocent to what they did wrong. They didn't even know they did. And they're just part of the situation, but they didn't make the situation. They're going to be there. They're going to be there for you. So anyway, the rest of the story. Uh, You're over now. So. Okay, so we're at the end of an hour of our time and uh, I just want you to know how much I love you how much I've wanted to bring someone to this point uh, so that they can say that's me and I'm worship I'm going to worship my way out of this I'm going to worship my way out of this and you're going to feel God come in and you're going to know hey if I still feel like this after worshiping God this is something that God's got for me but I guarantee you, when you start to worship God, you start to be lifted up. Things begin to change. Things break off of you. 
scales come out of your eyes and you can see the situation. And I just want you to know, I wanted this day to happen. I've been excited. Didn't know how it was going to happen. I was saying when I was coming online, Lord, I've got all these things, but I don't see where it's coming together. But now I do. <laughs> it's so exciting for me to see how it just came together. Because I didn't know how it was going to come together. You know, the worship thing is the reason when you've heard stories said about how um, a person who's like life, their relative, their, their child or their spouse or their one of their relatives, what, the life was taken, right? And somebody has gone to prison uh, to serve time for it. And sometimes that person can go in and forgive that person that took the life of their loved one, the reason is because they worship the Lord. I don't think they could do it really um, very easily if they didn't worship the Lord. And they go in there sometimes, <coughs> they go in there sometimes and they minister to that person who took the life of their loved one. You hear these stories, and, and some people say, I "Wonder how." Some people say, "How in the world can that person go in there and forgive that person and minister to them and love on them?" It's because that person has stepped over into worship, and they just they just worship the Lord over what that person had done to their loved one, and they're able. The Lord lifts them up above it. He lifts them up above it so that they're not focused and held in chains and in bondage to that situation. That's what worship can do. That's what That's worship can do. That's the power of worship. And you think that your anger is your right. But I know a man who was done so dirty and so wrong that... I understood it when he said, I can never forgive. I can never forgive what's happened, what these people did to me, what this spouse did. And I understand his emotion. I understand his feelings. But I also understand there's only one way he is going to get out of that deep, dark dungeon of unforgiveness and pain and anger. And that is to worship over that, on that person that did him so wrong. I mean, devastatingly did him so wrong. And, and because the, the husband never faced any uh, consequence for everything he was accused of, proves that he was innocent. But even in his innocence, he's still in prison. He's still in dungeon. He's still in a dark place until he begins to worship. And, you know, I can recommend you. If there's somebody that you say and have said in your life, I can never forgive them. I agree. I agree. They did the worst thing in the world. You can never forgive them. Okay, I'm not going to judge you for that. You can't. But I am going to tell you that, that if you will worship the Lord over even if you're gritting your teeth, I worship the Lord over this person, this country, and this attitude, this, this that they did to me. Just worship over them. Just worship them. Worship God over them. Worship you, God, over this nasty human being. Did this and this and this to me. Even if you say it that way, I'm okay with that. I worship you over this filthy. I, I'm good with that. Because God. But you know what? If you worship, something inside you is going to get set free. And some way, somebody with a light is going to show you a way out. And even though you feel like right now, I'll never forgive them. As a matter of fact, you may even say, I don't want to ever forgive them. Just worship over Just worship over Worship your Lord over this person that did this to me. You know, don't even say, you know, a false... A false forgiveness when you don't mean it. You know, well, I forgive him in Jesus' name. 
fine. But worship the Lord over them. You will find that the light will come. Before the doors are even open, you will be lifted up. So worship your way out. I'm so glad you were with me tonight. Whether you're here tonight or whether you're replaying the ship and the others and my front row people, thank you so much. I treasure you more than you know. Even sometimes when I look towards my uh, Thursday and things like that, I'm like, I'm going to make my way to Thursday. And I'm going to get there and God's going to do something just because I, I want to be with you. So had a wonderful week. Good rest of the week. Get your rest. Take your vitamin C. Keep yourself warm. Uh, if it gets cold and warm, cold and warm, cold and warm, it's harder to stay well. So keep that hat with you. Keep your gloves with you. Keep your jacket on. And watch it for the whole winter, winter. He's still out there. Don't let him fake you out. Anyway, anything further? Keep your ears, keep your ears covered. Cotton ball or something in your ears if it's yep. cold, because um, keep your ears yeah, cold. your ears can get an infection and it can go into your glands and all that kind of stuff. The cotton balls keep it warm enough in the air canal, or bacteria can't grow. If you're if you're out in the cold, but even if you have a hat on. Put some little cotton balls or something in your ears. Keep the air from going in there through your hat or whatever. Yeah, because you may take your hat off part of the day because it's warm. Well, you still get the cotton balls in there protecting you. Yeah. And so take care of yourself. Watch out for things. And don't forget, it's Saturday, 7. We're not sure what we're doing yet this Saturday, uh, depending on the weather, but it looks like rain. So, uh, we do have some rainy day things to go do. We're looking forward to vlogging that. Got some exciting ones coming out. And anyway, one more time. Good night. I love you. Jesus loves you more than I do. And I love you a lot. Thank you for being with me. <sighs> good night, good night, good night. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Did we forget something else? Oh, I wanted to say. Oh, what my, about your do, cabin? The, the 2500, is that coming up this uh, pretty soon. Um, I wanted to say tomorrow, um, instead of the live stream, we might pop, we might. You mean, pop, you mean Saturday? Sa yeah, Saturday. We might pop up a, a premiere of a of the uh, a, a hike we did on a trail um, and a waterfall and everything. Hmm. So I might do that. So we'll see, because you know, depending on the weather depending and everything, weather. we've been trying to not. Um, be out in the weather right now since it's been up and down. <laughs> up and down. And, uh, but we we don't like to just sit in front of you and talk either. We want to show you something so you can enjoy yeah. the smoky. That's one compliment we appreciate when you always say, it's like we're here with you. We're there with you. We like that. All right. Thanks. Good night. Good night.